So we're going to continue reading chapter four today. It is kind of a long chapter, so we are going to break it up into two sections, which I think is fine. Um, but anyway, so let's just quickly review what we talked about last time. Um, the race, Jess was going to be the fastest. Unfortunately, Leslie beat him, and he was pretty upset about that. Uh, so anyway, in this chapter, in this section, we are going to see um, that Leslie is a very good student. She's a great writer, but she doesn't own a TV. Weird. And all the other kids make fun of her. And then a bully named Janice Avery gives Leslie a hard time. Uh, and then Jess and Leslie start to become friends and they make an imaginary kingdom. And we will talk about that more another time because we're just going to start uh, uh, the first half of chapter four. It's a pretty long chapter. So without any further ado, here we go. Rulers of Terabithia. Now, what I notice specifically is the chapter is titled Rulers of Terabithia. And the whole book is called Bridge to Terabithia. Hmm. Interesting. Wonder how they get into Terabithia. All right, here we go. Because school had started on the first Tuesday after Labor Day, Labor Day, it was a short week. It was a good thing because each day was worse than the one before. Leslie continued to join the boy at races, and every day she won. By Friday, a number of the fourth and fifth grade boys had already drifted away to play King of the Mountain on the slope between the two fields. Since there were also, since there were only a handful left, they didn't even have to have heats, which took away a lot of the suspense. Running wasn't fun anymore. And it was all Leslie's fault. Jess knew now that he would never be the best runner of the fourth and fifth grades. And his only consolation was that neither was Gary Fulcher. They went through the motions of the contest on Friday, but when it was over and Leslie had won again, everyone sort of knew without saying so that it was the end of the races. At least it was Friday and Miss Edmonds was back. The fifth grade had music right after recess. Jess had passed Miss Edmonds in the hall earlier in the day. She stopped him and made a fuss over him. Did you keep drawing this summer? May I see your pictures or are they private? Jess shoved his hair off his red forehead. I'll show you. She smiled her beautiful, even-toothed smile and shook her shining black hair off her shoulder. Great, she said. See you. He nodded and smiled back. Even his toes had felt all warm and tingly. Now, as he sat on the rug in the teacher's room, the same warm feeling swept through him at the sound of her voice. Even her ordinary speaking voice bubbled up from inside her, rich and melodic. Miss Edmonds fiddled a minute with her guitar, talking as she tightened the strings to the jingling of her bracelets and the strumming of chords. She was in her jeans as usual and sat there cross-legged in front of them as though that was the way, te the way teacher always did. She asked a few of the kids how they were and how their summer had been. They kind of mumbled back, she didn't speak directly to Jess, but she gave him a look with those blue eyes and then made that made a zing like the one of the strings she was strumming. She took note of Leslie and asked for an introduction, which one of the girls prissily gave. Then she smiled at Leslie and Leslie smiled back. The first time Jess could remember seeing Leslie smile since she won the race on Tuesday. What do you like to sing, Leslie? Oh, anything. Miss Edmonds picked a few odd chords and then began to sing more quietly than usual for that particular song. I see a land bright and clear as the time's coming near when we will live in this land, you and me, hand in hand. People began to join in quietly at first to match her mood, but as the song built up at the end, their voices did as well. So by the time they got to the final, free to be you and me, the whole school could hear them. Caught in the pure delight of it, Jess turned and his eyes met Leslie's. He smiled at her. What the heck? 
There wasn't a reason he couldn't be. What was he scared of anyhow? Lord. Sometimes he acted like the original yellow-bellied sapsucker. He nodded and smiled again. She smiled back. He felt there in the teacher's room that it was the beginning of a new season in his life, and he chose deliberately to make it so. He did not have to make any announcement to Leslie that he had changed his mind about her. She already knew it. She plunked herself down beside him on the bus and squeezed over closer to him to make room for Maybell on the same seat. She talked about Arlington, about the huge suburban school she used to go to with its gorgeous music room. But not a single teacher in this beautiful, in it as beautiful or as nice as Miss Edmonds. You had a gym? Yeah, I think all the schools did, or most of them anyway. <sighs> she sighed. I really miss it. I'm pretty good at gymnastics. I guess you hate it here. Yeah. She was quiet for a moment, thinking. Jess decided about her former school, which he saw as bright and new with a gleaming gymnasium larger than the one at Consolidated High School. I guess you had a lot of friends there, too. Yeah. Why'd you come here? My parents are reassessing their value structure. Huh? They were decided... They decided they were too hooked on money and success. So they bought that old farm and they're going to farm it. Think about what's important. Jess was staring at her with his mouth open. He knew it and he couldn't help himself. It was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. But you're the one that's got to pay. Yeah. Why don't they think about you? We talked it over. She explained patiently. I wanted to come too. She looked past him out the window. You never know ahead of time what someone's, what something's really going to be like. The bus had stopped. Leslie took Maybelle's hand and led her off. Jess followed, still trying to come, for, trying to figure out why two grown people and a smart girl like Leslie wanted to leave a comfortable life in the suburbs for a place like this. They watched the bus roar off. You can't make a go of a farm nowadays, you know, he said finally. My dad has to go to Washington to work, or we wouldn't have enough money. Money's not the problem. Sure it's the problem. I mean, she said stiffly, not for us. It took him a minute to catch on. He did not know people for whom money was not the problem. Oh. He tried to remember not to talk about money with her after that. But Leslie had other problems at Lark Creek. <laughs> at Lark Creek. That caused more of a rumpus than lack of money. There was the matter of television. It started with Mrs. Myers reading out loud a composition that Leslie had written about her hobby. Everyone had had to write a paper about his or her favorite hobby. Jess had written about football, which he really hated, but he had enough brains to know that if he said drawing, everyone would laugh at him. Most of the boys swore that watching, watching the Washington Redskins on TV was their favorite hobby. The girls were divided. Those who didn't care much about what Mrs. Myers thought chose watching game shows on TV, and those like Wanda K. Moore, who were still aiming for A's, chose reading good books. But Mrs. Myers didn't read anyone's paper out loud except Leslie's. I want to read this composition aloud for two reasons. One, it is beautifully written. And two, it tells us about an unusual hobby for a girl. Mrs. Myers beamed her first day smile at Leslie. Leslie stared at her desk. Being Mrs. Myers' pet was pure poison at Lark Creek. Scuba diving by Leslie Burke. Mrs. Meyer's sharp voice cut Leslie's sentences into funny little phrases. But even so, the power of Leslie's words drew Jess with her under the dark water. Suddenly, he could hardly breathe. Suppose you went under and your mask filled up, all with 
water and you couldn't get to the top in time? He was choking and sweating. He tried to push down his panic. This was Leslie Burke's favorite hobby. Nobody would make up scuba diving to be their favorite hobby if it wasn't so. That meant Leslie did it a lot. That she wasn't scared of going deep, deep down in a world of no air and little light. Lord, he was such a coward. How could he be all in a trouble just listening to Miss Myers read about it? He was worse a baby than Joyce Ann. His dad expected him to be a man. And here he was letting some girl who wasn't even 10 yet scare the liver out of him just by telling what it was like to sightsee underwater. Dum, dum, dum. I am sure, Mrs. Myers was saying, that all of you were as impressed as I was with Leslie's exciting essay. Impressed? Lord, he nearly drowned. In the classroom, there was a shuffling of feet and papers. Now I want to give you a homework assignment. Uh, muffled groans. That I'm sure you'll all enjoy. <sighs> yeah, all right. Anyway. Mumblings of unbelief. Tonight on Channel 7 at 8 p.m., there's going to be a special about a famous underwater explorer, Jacques Cousteau. I want everyone to watch. Then write a one-page telling what you learned. A whole page? Yes. Does spelling count? Doesn't spelling always count, Gary? Both sides of the paper? One side will be enough, Wanda Kay. But I will give extra credit to those who do extra work. Wanda Kay smiled from me. You could already see ten pages taking shape in her pointy head. Mrs. Myers. Yes, Leslie. Lord, Mrs. Myers was liable to crack her face if she kept smiling like that. What if you can't watch the program? You inform your parents that it is a homework assignment. I'm sure they will not object. What if? Her voice faltered. Then she took her head and cleared her throat so the words came out stronger. <clears throat> What if you don't have a television set? Lord bless me, don't say that. You can always watch on mine. But it was too late to save her. The hissing sounds of disbelief were already building into a rumbling of contempt. Mrs. Myers blinked her eyes. Well, <clears throat> well, she blinked some more. You could tell she was trying to figure out how to save Leslie too. Well, in that case, one could write a one-page composition on something else. Couldn't one, Leslie. She tried to smile across the classroom upheaval to Leslie, but it was no use. Class! Class! Her Leslie smile shifted suddenly and ominously into a scowl that silenced the storm. She handed out dittoed sheets of arithmetic problems. Jess stole a look at Leslie. Her face, bent low over the math sheet, was red and fierce. At recess time, when he was playing King of the Mountain, he could see that Leslie was surrounded by a group of girls led by Wanda Kay. He couldn't hear what they were saying, but he could tell by the proud way Leslie was throwing her head back that the others were making fun of her. Greg Williams grabbed him then, and while they wrestled, Leslie disappeared. It was none of his business, really, but he threw Greg down on the hill as hard as he could and yelled to no one in particular, Gotta go! He stationed himself across from the girls' room. Leslie came out in a few minutes. He could tell she had been crying. Hey, Leslie, he called softly. Go away! She turned abruptly and headed the other way in a fast walk. With an eye on the office door, he ran after her. Nobody was supposed to be in the halls during recess. Leslie, what's the matter? You know perfectly well what's the matter, Jess Aarons. Yeah. He rubbed his hair. 
if you just kept your mouth shut, uh, you could always watch it my... But she had wheeled around again and was zooming down the hall. Before he could finish the sentence and catch up with her, she was swinging the door to the girl's room right at his nose. Jess slunk out of the building. He couldn't risk Mr. Turner catching him, hanging around the girl's room as though he was some kind of pervert or something. After school, Leslie got on the bus before he did and went straight to the corner of the long back seat, right to the seventh grader's seat. He jerked his head at her to warn her to come up further up front, but she wouldn't even look at him. He could see the seventh graders headed for the bus, the huge, bossy, bosomy girls, and the mean, skinny, narrowed-eyed boys. They'd kill her for sitting in their territory. He jumped up and ran to the back and grabbed Leslie by the arm. You gotta come up to your regular seat, Leslie! Even as he spoke, he could feel the bigger kids pushing up behind him down the narrow aisle. Indeed, Janice Avery, who among all the seventh graders was the one person who devoted her entire life to scaring the wits out of anyone smaller than she, was right behind him. Move, kid. He planted his body as firmly as he could, although his heart was knocking at his Adam's apple. Come on, Leslie, he said. And then he made himself turn and give Janice Avery one of those lookovers from frizzy blonde hair to tight blouse, broad beam jeans to gigantic sneakers. When he finished, he swallowed, stared straight up into her scowling face and said almost steadily, don't look like there'll be room across the back here for you and Janice Avery. <laughs> Someone hooted, wait, watch us and wait for you, Janice! Janice's eyes were hate mad. But she moved aside for Les and Leslie, for Jess and Leslie, to make their way past her to their regular seat. Leslie glanced back as they sat down and then leaned over. She's going to get you for that, Jess. Boy, is she mad. Jess warmed to the tone of respect in Leslie's voice, but he didn't dare look back. Heck, he said, you think I'm going to let some dumb cow like that scare me? By the time they got off the bus, he could finally send a swallow past his Adam's apple without choking. He even gave a little wave at the back seat as the bus pulled off. Leslie was grinning at him over Maybelle's head. Well... He said happily, see you later. Hey, do you think we could do something this afternoon? Me too, I wanna do something too. Maybelle shrilled. Jess looked at Leslie. Nope, was in her eyes. Not this time, Maybelle. Leslie and I got something we gotta do just by ourselves today. You can carry my books home and tell mama I'm over at the Burks, okay? You ain't got nothing to do. You ain't even planned nothing. Leslie came and leaned over Maybelle, putting her hand on the little girl's thin shoulder. Maybelle, would you like some new paper dolls? Maybelle slid her eyes around suspiciously. What kind? Life in colonial America. Maybelle shook her head. I want Bride or Miss America. You can pretend these are bride dolls. They have lots of beautiful long dresses. What's the matter with them? Nothing, they're brand new. How come you don't want them if they're so great? When you're my age, <sighs> Leslie gave a little sigh. You just don't play with paper dolls anymore. My grandmother sent me these. You know how it is. Grandmothers just forget you're growing up. Maybell. Maybelle's one living grandmother was in Georgia and never sent her anything. You already punched him out? No, honestly. And all the clothes punch out too. You don't have to use scissors. They could see she was weakening. How about, Jess began, you coming down and take a look at them. And if they suit you, you could take them along home. When you go tell mama where I am, 
After they had watched Maybelle tearing up the hill, clutching her new treasure, Jess and Leslie turned and ran over to the empty field where the old Perkins place and down to the dry creek bed that separated farmland from the woods. There was an old crab apple tree there, just at the bank of the creek bed, from which someone long forgotten had hung a rope. We're going to stop there. All right, so uh, what's going on in Bridge Terabithia? All right, school begins. Leslie's a good student. She writes that great paper, but she doesn't own a TV, and the other kids think she's weird. A bully, Janice Avery, gives Leslie a hard time. All right, so drifted away to play King of the Mountain. Watch this. I love this. This is little Jeff. Watch. They're playing. So funny. <laughs> and boom. <laughs> King of the Mountain is the idea where you grab someone and you throw them down, and the last person on the mountain is King of the Mountain. <laughs> like the older sister here who knocks her little brother down. Boom. King of the Mountain. Boom. <laughs> Funny. It's terrible. Don't do that to your little siblings. All right, drifted away. The racing wasn't fun. Everybody just kind of went and found something else to do. All right, running wasn't fun. It was all Leslie's fault. Jess and Leslie aren't friends yet at this chapter. In fact, Jess doesn't like her at all. In fact, she has ruined one of the things he likes the most, running, and she ruined it. All right. We get this word fiddled to touch or fidget or play with something. And so um, uh, the teacher, Miss Edmonds, is fiddling with her guitar as she's getting it set up and you know, prepared and the chords there. All right, mumbled back. So she's like, what do you guys want to play? And the kids are mm -hmm. all right. But his heart is zinging. Zing! I think she's so special, Miss Edmonds. A yellow-bellied sap sucker, coward. We usually um, think of things with yellow bellies as being cowards. And so, yeah, Jess is a coward. Leslie was really good at gymnastics. If you don't know the word gymnastics, there's a picture of gymnastics. Now, Leslie says that her parents are reassessing their value structure, which is a funny way to say that they are too hooked on money. And it's kind of this fancy way of saying, my parents work so hard and they're never around and they're very important and make lots of money. And anyway, Jess is like, what? Too much money? That's ridiculous. I've never heard of that. So anyway, it means uh, Leslie's parents are trying to simplify their lives not be so concerned with their jobs, trying to take a slower, easier form of life. All right. Do Leslie's parents want to change the focus of their lives? The answer, of course, is yes, they do. They're tired of working so hard for only money. Money just isn't the most important thing to them anymore. All right. The suburbs... We kind of live in the suburbs, most of us, Anaheim, Fullerton, Buena Park, like all the houses are kind of the same. All right, for a farm like this, this old ratty beat up farm, you want to live, leave a nice place like that to live in a place like this? Are you crazy? So Jess is having a hard time understanding Leslie and her family and their values. All right, uh, it took him a minute to catch on. Was it? Now I get it. Because he's like, I've never heard of somebody not needing money. Not worried about money. Like, your parents never worried about money? I don't even understand that. Ooh, I get it now. Took him a minute to catch on. All right. Uh, Washington Redskins. They were a football team. They are still a football team, but they are changing their name. Now they're just like the Washington football team or something like that. Um but anyway, that's not really the point. The point is that most of the boys say, my hobby is watching football. And Jess is like, well, I want to say my hobby is drawing, but then everyone will make fun of me. So, whereas Leslie says that her hobby is scuba diving. 
Right. It also says she's in dangerous territory becoming the pet. Right. Straight A's forever. The teacher's pet. It's a bad thing. Nobody wants to be a teacher's pet. You can be my pet. I'll treat you good. But uh, anyway. Um, yeah. So she's a, she's a teacher's pet. Most students don't like that. All right. Leslie likes to scuba dive. And it says he nearly drowned from reading this paper. So did he almost drown? Did Jess almost drown while the teacher read Leslie's paper? No, of course not. He didn't almost drown in the classroom, but the paper was so good. He felt like he was actually underwater and that made him feel like he was drowning. That means Leslie is a very good writer and her subject of being underwater scared Jess. So he is kind of someone who gets scared easily. All right. Leslie says, but what if I don't have a television set? And all the other girls are like, what? Why do the kids make fun of Leslie? Because she doesn't have a TV set at home. That's weird to them. Strange. All right. The teacher says, well, in that case, one could write a one-page composition on something, couldn't one? This is an important critical reading thing because we have one, one, one. In that case, one could write a one-page composition, couldn't one? And we use the word one as a self-reflective pronoun. Instead of using I or you, we say one. Like, one could teach English, couldn't one? Or I could teach English, couldn't I? But it's just a fancier way of saying that. But the difference here is one, same word, one, one. But this is the number one here, right? It's one page composition. So you have to read one, one, and one as differently. These two are the same. This one has a different meaning. Ditto to old fashioned way of making copies, like a copy machine. All right. Now, when we're reading, visualizing, it says playing king of the mountain. He's the king of the mountain. He's on the top. And every other person tries to come up, and you push each other down. And you, it's just kind of a big wrestling match, and it's supposed to be fun. All right, it says he threw Greg down as hard as he could. Do you think he was trying to hurt Greg? No, he wasn't trying to hurt Greg. But they're just playing. And so what he does, he's got Greg, and they're wrestling. And he sees Leslie, and he goes... I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go make sure she's okay. Gotta go. And he throws him down as hard as he can. And he runs off after her to make sure she's okay. Okay. They make fun of uh, Janice Avery calling her fat. Weight Watchers is a program that helps you with your food and helps you lose weight. And so they're saying, look out. She's so fat. She's going to take up the whole seat. You better move. It was mean, and all the kids were mean, and they're making fun of Janice. But that's what Weight Watchers means. Okay. Uh, lastly, I think almost lastly, uh, Leslie promises Maybell, Maybell, if you let us go play, I'll give you some of my paper dolls, which would be these. Okay, dolls that you could cut out, and you can change their clothes, and I don't know. Girls like them. Maybell was, was impressed. Um... Here at the very end of the section, um, is uh, you 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 coming down and taking a look at them? It's them, right? But again, we're getting this dialect. Um, you coming down and taking a look at them? And if they suit them, you could take them, take them along with you. So um, here, them, them, just another way to be reading carefully. All right. So what have we read so far? Miss Edmonds teaches music and thinks, and Jess thinks she is great. Jess begins to be nice to Leslie. Leslie's parents left good jobs and a nice house because they were tired of being so concerned with money. Leslie writes an incredible essay about scuba diving. It is so good. It actually scares Jess. And then Leslie tells the class she doesn't have a TV and everyone thinks she's weird and she goes to the bathroom and crying because they made fun of her. And on the way home, Janice Avery, Avery, a seventh grader, gives Leslie a hard time. So 
All right, that's all for now. We will finish chapter four on another day. Take care. Bye-bye.